as long as you have that understanding of what's in your control and what's out of your control, life becomes so much easier. It's actually a huge relief. Welcome to Inside Out Career Design. In this show, we're obsessed with answering a single question. Is it possible to create an authentic, meaningful, and fulfilling life you love while building a successful and rewarding career? My name is Peter Axtell, and I'm here with Nicola Vetter. We're co-founders of the whatsnext.com Career Insights platform and creators of the groundbreaking Motivation Finder Assessment. Join us as we seek to transform suffering into joy for millions of people stuck and confused in their lives and careers. We'll share our insights, discoveries, and life lessons and talk with career experts, leaders, spiritual guides, psychologists, data scientists, coaches, anyone who might hold a strategy or answer to the age-old questions of what's next for me and what should I do with my life? Are you trying to figure out what to do with your life? To figure out what to do with the precious time you've been given on this earth? Or to figure out what only you as a remarkable and unique individual can bring into this world? If you are, please join us for one of our live and completely free online workshops where we cover different topics to help you figure out what to do with your life and career without wasting precious time, taking wild guesses, or risking it all. To save your spot in our next live and free workshop, go to whatsnext.com forward slash workshops. We can't wait to see you there. Again, that's whatsnext.com forward slash workshops. Our guest today is Gregory Engel. Gregory is the stoic agilist, how he calls himself, and his newsletter. He has been writing software since high school and has a unique ability to create and respond to change in uncertain and turbulent environments. Using the ancient teachings of Stoicism to help companies improve with Agile is his compassionate approach and secret to leadership. Gregory knew that reading books and studying the lessons of history was a way to expand his world beyond the small town he came from, especially the book Meditations by Marcus Aurelius made a significant impact in his life early on when he was only 16 years old. This for him was the beginning of going back in history and translating the principles he learned from ancient thinkers into today's landscape. That's why we were so excited to talk with Gregory to learn more about Stoicism and how it can help someone who is looking for what's next. In our conversation, we also talk about how an early encounter with the lessons of Stoicism was a turning point in his life. How Stoic lessons are as relevant today as they were 1800 years ago. Why in an age of a fire hose of information, slowing down and taking in one insight at a time is so helpful and that physical books and audiobooks or whatever technology you use for insights can help you slow down. How history leads us to a lot of places that can expand our understanding of other areas. Why morning pages are useful for insights and decision making. Why starting a blog or newsletter is helpful to get feedback and not work in isolation. And why the idea of enough can be so freeing. And now it's time to listen and learn from Gregory. Welcome, Gregory. We've had a wonderful conversation some weeks ago, and I have read a lot about your thoughts that I believe can offer a different perspective to our audience of people asking, what's next for my life, for my career, or even the bigger question, what should I do with my life? But let's start 
with your own story. We want to hear about your insights, challenges, discoveries, life lessons, and especially those what's next moments in your life, those crossroads, how you approach them, what they taught you, and how you moved past them, how you navigated the challenges of work and life. So please share what brought you to where you are today. That is a, a very deep and interesting question. Uh, and uh, appreciate, first let me say thank you for having me on the podcast. I appreciate that having this opportunity. Uh, um, when I reflect back on 60 plus years now of uh, having uh, been mostly successful with uh, living on this planet, um, I can parse that out into um, big moments of what's next um, and smaller moments of what's next. And of course, a lot of little daily moments of what, what's next. And I think that's really what it comes down to is life can often be uh, an iterative process if we're going to succeed at what we're doing and pay attention to what we need to respond to. Um, so uh, my story, um, uh, if I think back on what are some of the, the first biggest uh, next step moments, um, uh, those would be points in my life where uh, it was very clear I had uh, a choice in directions on where to go. Um, some of these are obvious, like uh, what career do I have in mind? What school am I going to attend? Um, uh, who am I going to marry? Um, where am I going to live? Uh, and those certainly stand out. Um, and then a lot of smaller decision points that went into that, that whole process. Um, so I'm not sure how much you want me to go into detail as far as specifics or. Um, well, I'd be curious as to you could a couple of major turning points when you really had to make a significant decision. And what was your thought process? Did you make it all by yourself? Did you have help from someone else, a mentor? How did what was going on inside you when you had to make those major life uh, decisions? I think so. I think the first biggest change for me was probably in my mid teens. Um, uh, like a lot of people, I grew up in a family that was probably pretty average. So there were certainly struggles with that. I had a father that uh, was in a wheelchair from polio in the 1940s. So I've only ever known him in a wheelchair. Um, so in that time, uh, time frame around 15 or 16, um, uh, I think the movie Ben-Hur had, had made its splash on the screens. And I was very interested in history. Uh, in general, uh, particularly Roman history, and I came across this character named Marcus Aurelius uh, and liked some of what I heard about him. Um, I knew he was an emperor uh, in Rome and um, that he had a book um, I thought was pretty amazing because back when I was 15, the idea of someone living 2,000 years ago might have been somebody living in the Jurassic era. It, it was just beyond my comprehension. So that someone wrote a book that was that old, so I read it. Uh, Marcus Aurelius's meditations, and it had a, a very significant impact on me. Uh, and of course, I was introduced at that point to the Stoics. So I read more about Epictetus and Seneca were two of my other favorites. Uh, and the takeaway from there that really was the pivotal point for that point in my life, uh, being 15 or 16 years old, was this notion that I have what's inside of me, um, and I can control that. These would be my values or my beliefs my emotions even, and everything else was outside of my control. It was going to be the fates, as the Romans might call it, uh, would determine what was going to happen outside of my capabilities to control. All I had was, as the Stokes call it, my reason choice. I could choose where I wanted to go, what I wanted to do, or how I wanted to respond, uh, more importantly, to outside events. Um, so all the things that were happening around me that were unpleasant, um, I was choosing to respond to them differently as learning experiences, um, even to the point of some of them I put into the future. Um, I'm not going to do that when I'm an adult. Um, I'm not going to go in that direction or make those choices when I, I have an income that allows me to make them. Uh, and it served me very well. Um, and, and that never stops. Uh, as long as you have that understanding of what's in your control and what's out of your control, life becomes so much easier. It's actually a huge relief. Um, 
and it plays out even today if someone cuts me off in traffic that that happens to everybody and it's a common example um, i'm very quick to recognize that that's somebody who has a story of their own they're rushing to get home to a sick child or they've had a bad day at work uh, it is not about me um, or they simply didn't see me in the rearview mirror uh, there could be many reasons, big or small, uh, and it's easy to not even grab onto that. So I don't even have to let go of it. Uh, and as we go through life, we have more and more decisions that are more and more difficult, it seems. Uh, and it has served me well uh, ever since that time. So that would be the first big turning point, I think. When you had the inevitable struggles that we all have, that was your source of wisdom when you had to make decisions and you hit obstacles that it was the Stoics that you went to. It wasn't your teachers, your parents, it was actually the Stoics. Uh, to start with, as I got older and started to have uh, better teachers in school and, and I did have leaders there that helped me in other ways uh, and helped me make decisions, uh, but they were mostly, uh, frankly, academic, uh, professional, direction I might take, which was still very important. Um, uh, but as far as my own sense of self or being or who I am, it really did come from books. Um, I didn't have access to, uh, or given where we live, there weren't that many people around us. Uh, so I didn't have any physical mentors. Um, and, uh, uh, and we just didn't cross paths that much until later when I could get out of my own and I can go seek them out. Uh, and I'd read about people and I could go find them and study with them. Uh, and then that just accelerated the process. But yeah, it was really that simple. I extract a lot from books. Maybe, maybe people in our generation did that more than they do now. Mm. I think you bring up a great point for somebody who is trying to figure out what's next, what's next to do with my life and my career. The, wealth of wisdom that is in books, despite the fact that the numbers of people who are actually reading books, I really feel that people are missing out because you're a perfect example of going to books to get wisdom. Perfect example of that. I think that's a great lesson for anybody listening to this, to reading the, the biographies or whatever. What kind of other books do you, do you read to help, did you help expand your horizons? Well, history leads you to a lot of places. Um, so I got to know about Buddha and um, Krishna, um, a lot more about Jesus um, uh, from the religious perspective. Um, uh, and as I, I came up through public education and uh, studied um, deeper philosophy, more current Western philosophy, such as Nietzsche, um, there's, there's an endless list. It seems like uh, I could expand my understanding into other areas of, of what was available. Um, you touched on something too, that I think maybe one st half step back is that I think is important, uh, because I, I think it's true today, even though it, it was probably what helped me accelerate my understanding you know, 30, 40 years ago is back then with the, with a book, it took time you would have to read it, you would have to go to the library and get it, um, you'd have to buy it and it might come four weeks later. Uh, uh, so it, you would read it and it would have time to soak in uh, to my understanding and I could correlate it with, with other ideas. Today it's such a fire hose or multiple fire hoses that a person deliberately has to slow down and take some time when they're reading something like Marcus Aurelius or Epictetus uh, and think about it. Um, Epictetus, for example, will have maybe one sentence or two sentences in a piece of uh, any one of his books. And um, I almost always start my day reading one of those little snippets and let that percolate throughout the day. Uh, and even though I've read some of them many times, um, there's always a deeper, deeper understanding to some of these. So the thing somebody can do today is deliberately slow down. Uh, it doesn't matter that it's a book. It can be a web page. Uh, it can be a tweet. Um, some little thing that catches your mind as to uh, that that's important or that's funny or that's encouraging. Uh, anything that makes you slow down and stop, uh, give it a moment to, to sink in. And that moment could be maybe the rest of the day. Uh, but it's a skill. Uh, it's something I think we actually have to work harder at to learn how to do today. In, in education parlance, it might be called the transference of learning. 
what is it that I read on this tweet that I want to now transfer to my understanding of how I'm going to treat my kids or raise my pets or move to a new city. I'm, I'm very interested in this as well on how to extract stuff out of books rather than just reading and then you just forget everything. What actual tips would you give to somebody listening to this? The one was to slow down and then how would they actually take in what they read better? Hmm. Um, that's, a, that's a challenging question because it depends, I think, on a number of factors. Uh, your experience with the material, of course, is important. Uh, I think Marcus Aurelius is, is very accessible. Uh, he's uh, He writes in uh, sort of the common language of, of the time, which anyone could understand. If you're wanting to understand someone like Nietzsche, uh, that's probably more like opening up a biochemistry book and wanting to understand what's going on there. It's possible, um, but it would take more time. So the, the familiarity with the information and the topic can make that a little easier. So allowing some time for that. Uh, I think other factors that would make a difference in being able to absorb what you read would be the environment. Um, uh, if you can read away from noise uh, as disruptive noise, like traffic or jackhammers, is obvious examples, things like coffee shops are great places to, to read because you've got the background noise that allows you that immersive experience to read a paragraph or a page or a chapter and, and uh, your brain is better adept at, at soaking that in than if you're uh, in a noisy workplace environment or uh, you know, someplace where you're going to get interrupted a lot. Uh, so minimize the interruptions, minimize uh, the distractions and the noise uh, will help you learn better too to absorb whatever that information is. Um, yeah, I said there's there's a number of factors that can go into that. Is uh, there could be some uh, other cognitive issues in play. Um, people who struggle with dyslexia, this one I know too well, uh, can make it a challenge to read. So finding, in this case, technology that actually helps you out can be a big boon. Experiment around with, with how technology can help you out with that. Maybe listening to books is a better way to, to get the information that rather than reading them. Uh, watching a video along with the book, if that's possible, you know, uh, movies, for example, is a good way to, to, to absorb that information. So if, uh, pay attention to cognitively how well you uh, take in information, what your preferred channels are, and uh, adapt your material to that. Mm. Now, you have not only read a whole bunch, but you've also been writing a lot about not only stoicism, also about agile, which we'll touch on uh, later. How did you how did your writing journey start and how has it helped you in your life and career? Also very early, probably even earlier, no, definitely even earlier than, than stoicism. Um, my mother saved a book that I wrote when I was five uh, about a mouse living oh. under a garbage can in a, in a, a picnic area. <laughs> even, even had the illustrations. Uh, um, uh, so writing was has always been a way for me to express myself. I mentioned dyslexia earlier. It's been difficult for me to read. I had a stutter as a kid. I had to uh, overcome that. Uh, but I could always write fluently um, once I knew how to write. Uh, it, it's the beauty of the written word is is you can present yourself as 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 you wish. Um, and uh, I encourage people to get better at their writing because it is a reflection on who you are. Um, so writing from an early age, uh, writing to express myself, um, and as I grew older, it became a way to clarify my thinking, and, and that's true today. Uh, I write articles and put them out on, on the Internet and publish them so that I'll get feedback uh, Occasionally, it's very critical. Uh, somebody will see something in what I'm thinking uh, that is key for me to revise how I'm approaching the world or how I think about something. Um, so that's how I clarify my thinking. Um, and as a consequence, I think it clarifies uh, at least hopefully a little bit how I speak uh, and how I communicate uh, my thoughts uh, through the spoken word. Uh, and that's also never ending. Um, I write every day uh, for at least, probably at least an hour, uh, depending. 
Um, I just cannot not write. It's that important. That's inspiring. Do you do morning morning pages that from? I do. Um, I was a. Uh, uh, an early adopter of Julia Cameron's work uh, where she wrote The Artist's Way, uh, read the hard copy on a beach in Hawaii and started right away. Again, no internet. It was all pen and paper. Uh, and it was that way for, see, that book came out in the early 90s. Uh, it was, my pages were hard pages for, uh, hard written pages for at least 12 years, 12, 13 years. Uh, now I do it on a keyboard. Um, I think I've got the practice of the principle behind it. Uh, such that it works well for keyboards. So anyone thinking of starting something like that, I highly encourage Julia Cameron's book and to write it out by hand. Get it out of your head and get it onto something that you can set aside and come back and read later. When you say uh, writing by hand, I hear all kinds of theories about it. She's a big believer in writing literally pen to paper. Yes. And then other people do it by, by keyboard. Do you have an opinion on that, whether a keyboard or writing by hand is, makes a huge difference? Definitely suggest starting by hand, pen and paper. Uh, uh, there's magic that happens there, I think. Um, Matthew Crawford also has a number of books about creativity and uh, um, getting our thoughts outside of our head with our hands. In his case, he's talking about building things, uh, that there's something fundamental about that, something neurologically important about doing that. That's how we as humans changed the world. With these big brains, but if they're locked inside our head and we don't do anything, um, nothing happens. It's, it's you know, these, these hands that we have that actually end up uh, making the things that change the world. Uh, and so by putting pen to paper uh, and getting our thoughts out on paper, uh, it's a very important transformative experience over time, particularly to do that. And once you understand that or have a good feel for that, then certainly go to something electronic. It's a lot more convenient, I think, uh, to be able to write the pages anywhere I'm at if I've got some kind of device around me. So you can transition from writing to paper to doing it electronically, and that works as well. It does. Um, and there's some benefits to that, too. Um, uh, I use a tool called Obsidian. Uh, to organize all my writing. Uh, I've got thousands and thousands of snippets in there. Uh, so I do my pages in there and I add tags to it. So if I happen to be writing along uh, and I, I key into something having to do with how I'm going to market my, my practice or my consulting, um, when I'm done with the pages, usually it takes about 20 minutes, um, 500 words is what I shoot for. I'll add a couple of quick tags on some things that might be in that particular day's pages hashtag marketing, um, hashtag, you know, software, whatever it is that, that happens to come up uh, during my pages. And then I can cross-reference it and get back to it. Oh, let's drill down on this a little bit because I'm imagining that our audience, people who are, they're choosing, changing, or advancing their career, and I think you've touched on a valuable tool to get this out of your head that you're imagining this and that, that you're writing it, would you, how would you envision somebody who's trying to find their way to, maybe they want to change their career, maybe they've just gotten laid off by Microsoft. How would you use this idea to, to journal or to write morning pages to, to help them, to guide them to take that next step? So often what comes up for me while I'm doing the daily pages, and I'd make a distinction between my daily pages and journaling. Um, Journaling has a deep tradition in psychotherapeutic uh, interventions, and um, I think I think I'm all I think I'm all in favor of that that some powerful things have happened there. My understanding is, my understanding of the distinction is that journaling would be for more therapeutic outcomes that are of a deeper nature, whereas Julia Cameron's pages are a, a free form exercise in what's in my mind for about 20 minutes first thing in the morning. Uh, to get the practice of you know my fingers on the keyboard uh, um, or the pen on paper of transferring my whatever's in my head onto a paper. Um, so I make that distinction. Um, so the way I think pages are helpful um, for anyone considering where to next is that since it is a free form flow of ideas, that if what's on their mind happens to be a career change or maybe they're they're being asked to relocate to a city, uh, their emotions, their feelings about that will will come up, and it's it's good to write them out. Um, 
Then there's the option to go back and read the last couple of days or last couple of weeks worth of notes. And they're there so that you'll recall what it is you might have been thinking uh, uh, and start to put some of the dots together, those connect the connections together. Make up an example here. If I had been doing the pages about a career change or a job change, specific to a job, over the last two, maybe three weeks, and I go back and I look at those notes and I see, uh, you know, I, I really have a lot of negative things to say about this job. Uh, and they all seem to be around not being appreciated or not having the opportunity to advance. Uh, and it may not seem while I was writing each one of those notes that it was a big deal. Um, but the idea of putting something on a page and then walking away from it uh, and then come back and coming back to it later uh, is that that gets revealed. You start to see the patterns uh, on what's important to you. Um, and that in itself can suggest some pretty powerful decisions uh, or directions you may want to take and help with decisions. That's a great idea to see the patterns of your thoughts about the pros and cons. Yeah, you were going to say? Now, people can can see what you have written online on your website. And I am wondering what you think about people that are looking for this next chapter, whether it might be helpful for them to become visible in a way like you are visible uh, to the world because you've put something out there. But it would be different than just putting something out there on on LinkedIn or Medium. So do you think that might be helpful as well? I do believe it's important to get feedback about what, what you're thinking about doing in the world. Um, writing is certainly one way to do that. Um, um, YouTube videos, uh, attending meetups, uh, there's a lot of ways to participate in, in the world around you and hear from others what they think of your ideas. It's better to have more input into decisions you're pondering than less. Um, if you only get one or two things, one or two people telling you, oh, yeah, you need to change jobs, then you might not be making the best decision. But if, if you have had a chance to expose your your ideas to say 20 or 30 people over the course of whatever time, you might hear a different perspective uh, that you know, where you're working is a really great company, you're just in a bad place, you need to try and see if you can move somewhere else, um, or yes, it's a good idea to change, but here's a better company that will allow you to just almost transfer all your expertise. Uh, you'll get higher orders of, of, of feedback uh, and more valuable feedback if, if you put yourself out in, in the world. Um, and there are people that start blogs and uh, newsletters uh, expressly for the purpose of journaling that whatever journey they happen to be on. Um, and uh, uh, from what I've seen from a few of them that I'm familiar with, they they have had a very positive experience with that. Um, so I would encourage it um, in any way you can think to do it. Uh, so we're not working in isolation. Uh, but we probably can all recognize when we've made some really bad decisions because we only consulted with me, myself, and I. <laughs> we're, we're big fans of uh, William B. Irvine on in his book on how to live a stoic life. Or no, maybe it's the, A Guide to the Good Life, I think it's called. It'll be in the show notes. Because stoicism is so often misunderstood it really stands for hope and optimism. So how has living a stoic life helped you in your life and career decisions? What comes first to mind is, is uh, there's just a whole lot that happens in the world that doesn't affect me. Uh, it doesn't, not because I don't care. It isn't that kind of issue. It's um, iPhones are, I think the example I use pretty frequently once upon a time owned an iPhone. I don't even know what version, two or three, something long time ago. Uh, anytime there's a new iPhone, there's used to be people outside the store and around the block. Uh, I was never fascinated with that kind of, uh, that kind of technology or, or um, I didn't get attached to it. It's again, that internal thing, external thing. Uh, and so I was never drawn into this upgrade cycle uh, of, 
you know, the latest and greatest hardware. Uh, the same thing for automobiles. I drive a 22 year old pickup truck and hope to take that one to its rust grave. Uh, there's an on and on and on. It's an endless list. Uh, I have then what I've able, been able to do then is separate out the criteria that are actually important to having a good life or living a good life. Um, so even though there were times when I was not earning much money, I still made sure I could afford or bought the best food I could afford. Uh, so I had good nutrition, um, clean water, uh, and everything to do with staying healthy. That so much, uh, result, so much revolves around having a good, uh, healthy person. Um, and the recent pandemic is certainly a good example of that. Uh, so that was an important criteria for me to have good food, the best food I could possibly afford. Um, whereas phones, automobiles, um, my other re weakness would probably be books. Um, cause I've got way too many books. Uh, but, um, a friend of mine once challenged, had a challenge for a group of us. And he said, how many tools would, or how many things would you have to let go of before you started to feel the pinch? You know, could you let go of your house? Could you let go of your clothes? Could you let go of uh, you know, your automobile, things like that? And um, for most of us, it got down to a pretty small list. Uh, and so for me, it was food. It was my books. It was um, also my tools. I do a bit of woodworking. Um, if, I can, if I can fix my house up without having to have somebody come in, then uh, that saves me that energy. Uh, and as a nice byproduct, uh, I, I spend less money. Uh, so I'm very, very happy, uh, certainly with my life and, um, have managed to, uh, you know, build up enough of a nest, nest egg that I think I'll be comfortable, uh, all because I did less rather than chased more. We could talk, we could talk more about more and when is enough enough. That that's a whole nother topic. Uh, okay, I'll, I'll I'll follow that trail because um, it does fascinate me. Um, we're all familiar with this uh, expression, uh, moving the goalposts. Um, happens a lot in the corporate environment. Uh, you know, if you just if you just do ABC, when you get there, you'll get the promotion and the raise, and you get there, and somebody's moved the goalposts off. Uh, so it's just a little bit more, um, and that's different from this notion of enough. Um, if I'm going for a goal. And I have a very clear sense of steps to get there. I'll probably get there, assuming somebody doesn't move those goalposts. Uh, and then I've got it. I've got my goal, and usually people trying to figure out a goal from there. But this notion of enough is a is different. Um, so if I think if I have sixty thousand dollars a year as an income, that will be enough. Uh, and if I'm or if I'm earning something like forty thousand or what or something like that. It might take me a while to get to 60,000, probably uh, a year or two, depending on the industry you're in or the skills you got or the credentials you have. Uh, it'll take you some time to get there. Well, in that journey to getting to enough, um, we change. Our identity shifts a little bit. Now we're a little more affluent. If it's the case of, of income, I'll, keep, I'll stay with that example. Uh, we're able to afford a little nicer things. Um, we can go out with our friends a little more often, so there's a little bit of bump in status. Uh, so over the course of that journey to what had previously been enough, our identity changes, and now enough is not enough. We want more. Uh, and there's these successive steps, uh, these gradual iterations uh, uh, that, that are all about more and more and perhaps more. Um, and in a worst case scenario, uh, there are people that have, uh, you know, millions of dollars, and um, they're always wanting something more. There, there's no way they could spend it on. There's nothing they can't pay for, uh, certainly on the, the basic needs level, uh, but they keep going. I think there's a story of uh, when the, uh, we had the crash of 2008, the banking crash, uh, whatever economists call that. Um, a German who had built something like a $5 billion empire uh, and because of the crash, he had lost $500 million. Uh, and he couldn't bear the loss. He's now only got $4.5 billion. And so um, he, he uh, killed himself by standing in front of a train. 
uh, it's a pretty drastic response to having lost uh, significant steps in that path towards enough. So when I coach teams, um, and I, I see this pattern pretty frequently where they're always looking for, in my case, it's often software, writing the better software. It could be better. It could be better. It could be better. I want to future proof it. They keep going and keep going. So I have to slow them down and teach them about this notion of, of when is enough enough? Uh, and I start have to introduce phrases like, well, it's not good enough yet, or it's not perfect yet. And that word yet is pretty important. It's something I learned from Carol Dweck's work on, on mindsets uh, is that when you say that word, it gives a bit of space in people's minds to take a breath, um, figure things out, assess the situation. Uh, and Carol Dweck has the example of when you're telling young school children if they fail a test or they, they didn't write a good essay and teachers get a lot of mileage out of telling the kids, well, um, it's a good paper, but it, it's, it's not, it's not good enough yet, or you're not good enough yet at this particular sport and words like yet introduce that, uh, that opportunity for, for individuals to know, well, I can keep working at it. It's not a done deal. Um, and they continue moving forward, uh, in exploring whatever it is they're interested in. Um, so enough is kind of a tricky thing is, uh, if, if we don't have our eye on that, it can actually control us rather than we controlling that notion of, do I have enough? I think you bring up so many great points, Gregory. The, I'm thinking of somebody, they're going to have to change careers. And some people are, shall we say, entitled, you know, I, I was earning this amount of money and maybe I can't make that amount of money anymore in today's world. And I now have to make less money that bothers people and understandably you get used to that and you say oh my gosh i'm it's kind of a step down but what you're also addressing is a key point that the idea of enough is also a sense of freedom because i know for a fact psychologically in your mind you think okay if i just that one more thing and then i can relax and this cycle continues on and when it gets out of hand it is literally like throwing gasoline on the fire, you think that you're going to get some inner peace emotionally and mentally, and just the opposite happens that throws gasoline on the fire, and then you're trapped in this, in this cycle. Imagine anyone listening to this, you're thinking, I have to change my career, I can advance my career, but what would it be like to set a goal? What would actually be enough, and how does that, how can I internalize the freedom that that could give me? Yeah, the, the what I would suggest there is uh, uh, a version of um, the experiment that some friends and I did uh, ages ago. What would it be like to lose those things? You look around what you have now. Uh, imagine um, not having them. And sometimes the thought experiment, uh, the, sometimes the thought experiment alone isn't enough. Um, and um, it, uh, a little bit of a tangent, but this idea of, you know, fasting, but, you know, see if you can go, you know, 24 hours without eating food. And um, what we came up with was there's a number of ways to fast. So have a spending fast. Um, the experiment I did with this one is could I go a month and not spend any money, an entire month? Um, and it's not the kind of thing you start tomorrow. Um, I had to actually think about that. What do I spend money on and what am I going to need to spend money on in the next 30 days? Uh, so it meant having a full tank of gas and running all the errands I was going to need to do before I filled up that, that tank of gas. So I had enough uh, food in the house. I was single at the time, by the way. Um, um, what bills am I going to have to pay? Can I prepay them? What kind of uh, expenses do I think I'm going to have? Uh, Am I going to allow myself uh, whatever it was, 50 bucks for uh, going out for drinks with friends? I had to think for 30 days, and it was harder than I thought it would be, uh, on what I would have to not be able to do um, with a spending fast. Um, there's that, or you can actually, if there's something you really like, I don't know, an Xbox. I don't have one, probably never will. Um, give it to a friend for 30 days uh, and see what happens to it. Um, there's a, a lot of uh, digital fasting uh, that 
is pretty popular out there right now. Turn your phone off for a day or a week um, and, and see what happens. Uh, turn off all notifications on your phone, uh, uninstall them if need be, uh, and find out really how valuable Twitter is if you don't have it for 30 days. Uh, then you start to actually understand what enough is because you've pulled back to a different position that you still are find out usually people that uh, they're just as happy at uh, and in fact even happier uh, and that will sort of bring back that notion of that outside outside the frame notion of when it's enough it'll kind of bring it back uh, and you may already be there um, so it's deliberate things like that to readjust and recalibrate our understanding and thinking about what enough is and what do we want and what do we value and what's important and where's quality. There's a lot of things that start factoring into that. What happened at the end of the experiment after 30 days? Uh, well, it, it had a momentum. It, it continued on. Uh, obviously, I went grocery shopping. Um, <laughs> uh, I didn't quite get that one right, uh, but I was determined to stick with it. Um, uh, and, it, and frankly, I, I, without saying it, I think I leaned on a couple of friends at the end there to pay the lunch bill. Um, you know, hint, hint, nudge, nudge. Uh, and this was uh, <laughs> shortly after I graduated college, so I had no money anyway. Uh, um, and so I continued on. Uh, and I think some of that still stuck today is uh, it's hard to sell me something if I don't already want it. So you don't say to your kids, kids, we're going to, you're going to be a little hungry for the next 30 days. And, but I'm doing this thing and, and just don't tell me that you're, you're hungry because we're going to do this thing. Pro <laughs> probably not. <laughs> no, uh, I wouldn't recommend that. Uh, if, if there's, if there's others involved, you need to have them in part of the plan. And <laughs> In your writing, you talk about this concept called aporia. My mom would call that a $25 word. I was like, what is aporia? What is that? And I, probably people listening to this probably don't know what aporia is either. So can you connect that idea in a way that would help a person trying to figure out what's next and is simple enough for the average person to understand aporia? It is a $25 word. Uh, <laughs> it, it's of those class of $25 words uh, that cost that much because it is so valuable. Um, it, it contains a lot of meaning. Uh, uh, it it takes a while to unpack it. It's a Greek word, I think it's Greek, uh, uh, that describes a mental state that happens when when we're confused. Um, uh, as an educator it, and uh, a coach, it's something I actually try to create in um, my clients or the teams I'm working with or my students uh, to get them to a state where they're a little bit confused and a little bit out of balance about what it is they're studying. Uh, Aporia is, is that open frame where the window's open for us to actually learn something new. Um, that internally, our thoughts and what we believed about a subject has been jumbled up just enough, has been, you know, um, just enough so that some new ideas can get in. And we're struggling at that point to make, make sense of it, to make it fit. Um, it, it isn't particularly pleasant. Um, people don't like being confused. They certainly don't like looking like they're confused. Uh, yet it is absolutely essential to learning new things. Um, I, I think Aporia is actually something most associated with Socrates. Uh, Socrates is infamous for pelting people with questions uh, to the point that they would begin to doubt their own positions about what they believed about courage or something like that. Uh, and the reason he's doing that is to create that state of aporia uh, inside what are typically his students um, so that they can consider the weaknesses of the position they held and the strengths of the position that they haven't considered. Uh, and when those two things come together, they understand their argument better and they understand the other side's argument better, uh, then they've got wisdom. Now they know something that the average person doesn't know. They know both sides of the argument. Well, is that a counterintuitive thing? You're yeah. saying that people could embrace the idea of being confused and not understanding and then sitting with that 
Mm -hmm. Oh, and and to to press the skill, uh, if if you recognize when that's happening, and then you learn how to actually create that within your own mind as you're learning something new. Uh, it just turbocharges anything you're trying to learn, whether it's physical or intellectual or, or anything like that. Um, I've studied martial arts uh, for a long time. I don't practice anymore. Uh, but for 25 years, I was on the mat to study Aikido. Uh, and it happened many, many times where I didn't understand physically what what was being demonstrated uh, and trying to figure out how to get my body to move in that direction. Uh, it is physically disoriented in the case of like learning how to dance or a martial art. Um, and after after enough experience with that, it is n it is no longer unpleasant. It's just another thing to kind of work through and uh, develop the skills to now focus on what it is that's new, what it is that you already know how to do, how you bring them together, and it can happen very very quickly. Uh, so as a skill for generating something like aporia, uh, that could be huge. Wow. Okay. <laughs> We 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 are yeah. totally with you. Yeah. This is really interesting. Now you've you've touched on your work today really slightly. You've been working as an agile coach for a decade now. Yeah, a little more than that. I think I officially had uh, the 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 title of agile coach. Uh, thinking back, maybe twelve, thirteen years ago. Sorry, I think I interrupted. Maybe finish your question. Now, I'm, I'm wondering, because you have suggested that an agile mindset helps resolve ignorance. And I think many people misunderstand what ignorance means. So can you speak to that a little? Let me start with this one. There's a, a little four by four square that is often shown about this little cycle people go through uh, as they become experts. Uh, one in, in one square, they are unconsciously incompetent. They're they're not good at being in what they're not good at doing something, and they don't know it. Um, and they tend to make a lot of bad decisions, thinking that perhaps they are good at it. Then the, something happens, and it becomes exposed to them that they aren't very good. So now they become conscious incompetence. I know I'm no good. I know I can't do this dance routine. I'm a klutz. Uh, so they study and they work on that uh, and they become conscious competence so that they are good dancers, but they really have to think about it. Uh, and it's not quite in their muscle memory yet. Um, and they practice that long enough and hard enough, then they become unconscious competence. So they can go through and do a dance routine and it looks as if they're not even thinking about it or having to work at it. Uh, that's the path of mastery right there. So in there is this notion of ignorance. Uh, and um, I think Socrates would probably say that uh, that's probably uh, the root of all people's stumbling block for gaining wisdom. Um, I mentioned earlier this notion of being able to argue both sides of an argument uh, or both you know, multiple dimensions of uh, an idea. Um, those who are not able to do that and they, they have their opinion about the world or themselves um, uh, are essentially ignorant about what else is out there. And then they have an experience that reveals to them that there's so much more to who they could be or the other side of the story kind of thing, walking in somebody's shoes, living in somebody else's house. Now that, that ignorance has been challenged by different knowledge or different data, more knowledge, uh, and now they have to assemble that into a higher order of understanding about the world. Uh, and that is is the essence of wisdom, is, is acquiring those multiple perspectives, whatever the topic, dance, philosophy, mathematics, um, how to write software, how to drive a bus. Um, it's everywhere. So how does this tie into, what is the definition of an agile mindset, and how does that help a person, say, to make the choices and decisions? Hmm. That comes out of uh, my experience with using Agile in specifically software environments. Uh, that's where the notion of Agile that's typically talked about today came from, is how to write software better. But I've known ever since the beginning that that's a, a limited case for the value of, of 
practicing things that are agile or having an agile mindset. Um, there's nothing new about agile in software development. It, it's got plenty of examples going back thousands of years that if I'm going to run five errands on a Saturday morning and I drive to the first place where I want to uh, take care of an errand and it's closed, I readjust. I figure out where can I go next. Uh, and that's the essence of Agile is, is you find the path of least resistance um, and you keep working, uh, iterating through potential solutions um, on your way to building great software or uh, you know, training your dog or, or anything like that. So this Agile in my mind isn't really something new. It's the mindset that, that um, has become coded in, I think, a useful way in the last 20 years that this notion of iterating through till you, you find a solution rather than stopping after the first iteration and saying, well, this isn't going to work. Um, of course, you're going to hit that, that the nature of, I think, living um, across all of life on this planet is that it's an, a never ending cycle of finding what works better, finding what works better, finding what works better. Very, very, very small pieces and a whole lot of littles make up a whole lot of lot. Uh, and then you find yourself there, wherever there is you want to be someday. Um, so that, in a nutshell, is the Agile mindset. It's Oh, I, I love that. Let's see if I understand this. It means that you're agile enough to continue to seek new solutions to obstacles that you encounter and find the path of least resistance. You just keep going. Mm -hmm. So this idea, rather than pounding against a brick wall, you're more agile seeing maybe your view expands, like it goes wider where you see more possibilities of decisions that you could make. Is that true? That That is true. Uh, I can add to that as well, that um, uh, when I'm describing, one way I describe the Agile mindset is that it's a way of thinking that leaves behind it an absolute mountain of techniques and tools and practices to help you do the kinds of things you just talked about. Uh, so it isn't like you're out on your own having to reinvent the wheel every time you encounter something is when you understand how to uh, ask good questions or what are the techniques in Agile is the five whys. If you need to find out why something is the way it is, you ask, well, why is that the case? And you ask it at least five times until you hopefully uh, get to a pretty low level of what the root cause is. Um, <clears throat> You know, that friend, my friend of mine keeps showing up late to this meeting. Why is that? You go look for an answer and you find out that um, he's always coming into the office late. Okay, why are you coming into the office late? You find out that he's got uh, a child with special needs that needs to be prepared for school. And um, at that point, you can probably stop. But, uh, you know, you ask a, a series of questions with this five wise technique uh, to get to a better answer than what you would have had if you just made something up off of limited information. And there's many, many, many techniques like that that would, would fall under the umbrella of an Agile mindset. Um, uh, and the more of those you're aware of and the more of those you practice, the stronger the Agile mindset is and the easier it is to move through challenges day by day and year by year. Let's move from Agile to Fragile. <laughs> In our conversation, you said... Uh, train the brain to be more anti-fragile, more flexible. Now, what does anti-fragile mean in practical terms and how can you form such a mindset? Um, practice. <laughs> uh, that's how we get there. Uh, so how, what to practice? Uh, that, that's, that's a very good question. Um, there's a, a related word to anti-fragile and, and Taleb, uh, who's the guy I think championed or came up with this notion of anti-fragile, uh, really recommend his work. I, I can't, I can't improve upon the way he's presented it. Uh, um, we'll put it in the show notes. It's Taleb Nasir, I think, yeah. or Nasir Taleb. Um, <laughs> something like that. Yeah. T-A-L-A-B. Uh, T-A-L-A-B. See, I don't even know. Um, <laughs> But uh, yeah, he wrote, he's written a number of books on this notion of anti-fragile. Uh, but the, re the related word to that that's a little bit different is this notion of resilience. Um, and people, I think, can relate to that a little bit easier. So that's, I think, a good place to, to lead into what it is to be anti-fragile. Um, if something is resilient, it usually means that if something on it fails, then there's a fallback system uh, to compensate for that. Um, 
if I'm working on a team uh, and I know a particular system that is required to be maintained, uh, then maybe I have a backup. So if I'm out sick or on vacation, then there's somebody who can take over the management of that system and uh, there'll be no interruption to the business. So that would be an example of, of resilience. Um, our automobiles have many layers of resilience built into them, airbags and crunchable fenders and all these things to help protect us in the event of something adverse happening. Uh, Anti-fragile is, is perhaps the next level above that uh, in that it, you are ending up in uh, a place where you don't even need to worry about the resilience. And I'm simplifying greatly here. Um, so it might go back to the example that I made about doing the spending fast and learning out or learning how uh, what was enough for me was substantially less than what I thought so that uh, after I finished that little exercise and I had built up enough savings just because I wasn't spending money, not that I had to work at it, then I've, I've got a mental state where uh, I'm less influenced by uh, vanity purchases or keeping up with the Joneses or things like that. Uh, so it just isn't even an issue. It isn't that I have to be resilient to the fact that my neighbor's got a nicer car. It just doesn't matter. Uh, um, so if we build uh, um, our understanding of the world and our mental state and, and how we, we go about making decisions in a way that's anti-fragile, then uh, as the word implies, it's just difficult to break. Um, so this is, might be a good criteria for somebody, again, when we come back to what should I do next with my life, to think about how could I build a resilient life mm -hmm. that gives me more freedom. And that's a really good way to make, make that kind of decision about a direction to go. I think that's fantastic. Yeah, I agree that I, I don't mean to dismiss resilience. It's a good idea to have it. Um, you know, an example of something resilient is... Um, uh, Ever since I could afford it, I had, uh, and the rates were good, I had uh, uh, six months worth of CDs laddered so that uh, uh, each one would carry my monthly salary if I lost my job. Um, so I knew that if I lost my job, I had an income for the next six months. Uh, that's resilience. Uh, so I definitely recommend putting in resilience where it makes sense. Uh, finances are a good place to do that. Uh, and then work beyond that to now make yourself mentally uh, um, more anti-fragile to anything that's out there, really. Mm -hmm. Love it. Yes, because the quality of your mind determines the quality of your life, right? I would agree with that wholeheartedly. <laughs> yes. Now, Gregory, we are already at, at time. We didn't even move into so many other stories of your mm -hmm. life. We might have you on again. It's I'm been too that. much fun. But for this for this time, is there anything that we didn't touch on besides all the other steps in your in your life and career, but something that you really want our audience to know? Uh, a parting thought would be uh, to um, have a robust network of relationships, uh, uh, acquaintances, friends, family, um, however it is that you can build that up. It, it is far too easy, especially post pandemic, to be isolated uh, in ways that we don't even recognize are unhelpful and unhealthy. Uh, and we're, we're starting to see, I think, the impact now that we're reintroducing ourselves back into social lives post pandemically. Uh, anything you can do to keep those relationships um, healthy uh, and alive, do it. Yeah, I think there's been plenty of research that says. Uh, it's the greatest, single greatest impact on longevity and health is the quality of our relationships. Mm -hmm. It is. And we're so happy to have you in our circle here and not too here. far away from where we live. That's true. That's a great place to stop right there. That's beautifully said. Well, thank so you. thank you so much for thank this you, wonderful Greg. conversation. And I hope we'll have you on again. I hope so too. Thank you both very much. I appreciate it. We hope you enjoyed this conversation. One of my biggest takeaways was how Julia Cameron's morning pages 
are a free form exercise to capture what's on my mind for about 20 minutes down onto paper or in a digital format that I can go back to in a few days or weeks to see what I was thinking about and start to see patterns of what's important to me. For example, I might see patterns as to why I don't like my job. That clarity will help with better decisions. Yes, and what stuck with me was the point that it's better to have more inputs about what you're thinking of doing than less. Getting some input from 5, 10, or 20 people might change your own perspective. We've all made some bad decisions because we only consulted me, myself, and I. <laughs> That's why people start blogging or writing newsletters to get feedback. Or start masterminds. Mm. To learn more about Gregory, head to whatsnext.com forward slash 21, where we share the transcripts, links, and more. Again, that's whatsnext.com forward slash 21. And if you like what you've heard, share it with someone you care about and subscribe, rate, and review our Inside Out Career Design Podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts so you'll never miss an episode. Thanks so much for joining us here today. We'll see you next week for another episode, same time, same place. <laughs>